Kia ora e hoa mā, ke te whakarongo mai ke koutou ki Arrow FM, your community access radio station. And this is an unscheduled program, this is just because I want to take advantage of the fact that the place is swarming with wordsmiths and, and um, gripping storytellers, because it's yarns and barns of course. Really pleased to have Carl Nixon with me. Good morning Carl. Good morning. Right. So... Carl, a novelist, playwright, and you used to be a, an improvisational comedian? I used to do improv at the Court Theatre. Um, they've got a show called Scared Scriptless, which I was a, a founding member of way back in the early 90s, uh, where they, yeah, they do improv, they do theatre sports type things. Oh, yeah, great. Well, look, look that resonates with my background because uh, I used to be an actor, and uh, particularly in the comedy area. Yeah. Improv is hard. Oh, I was never the funny one, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you were, were you intense? <laughs> I, 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 was the, I was the one who was making the stories chug along. There was a fair bit of storytelling in theatre sports, so yeah. Yeah, I used yeah. to be the one who kind of drove the narrative more than the funny one. I, could, I think driving the narrative is super important um, because otherwise it's just, just a load of blather. It's, yeah, it's just a load of gags and, they, yeah. and you run out of gags and then it just kind of stops. But if there's a story, people go, oh, that's, that's quite yeah. interesting. Yeah. And look, driving the narrative is clearly your skill. I've just finished, a couple of days ago, finished the tally stick. Um, I found it gripping from start to finish. In fact, look, I was at, at uh, the event last night at uh, Headley's Bookstore, and I was sitting there thinking, I wonder if he's going to give away any of the plot. It's a hard one to talk about without actually giving away the plot. I know. It, it's tricky because after you get beyond the first couple of incidents, you really don't want to talk about what, what's no. happening. Um yeah, so it's a tricky one to, to talk about and a tricky one to review, but most of the reviewers have got it pretty right, I think. Yeah. Um, sometimes you can you can be totally aware of, of what the plot is of something and it not make any difference, but I found that every single moment with this, I was interested about the next moment and never knew what it might hold for me, mm. and that just drove me right to the end which is wonderful mm, thank you yeah 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 that was the kind of the objective for this one i was you know when you're writing something you're not not quite sure where it's going to go so i was thinking oh well this is this is kind of a bit like a you know kind of famous five story in the drafts <laughs> at one point because it's to do with kids you know yeah and and, and they get lost in the woods and you know you think, mm. oh, so it's, it's a bit kind of famous fivey how do i make it a, a little less that way and more more adult more interesting and kind of breaking up the narrative fracturing the narrative so that mm. you're never quite sure what's going to happen next was a big part of that and breaking the chronology of it as well it starts in 78 but it jumps to 2010 mm. and it kind of jumps back to the early 80s it's you know it's a bit all over the place but i, I had to then i had to make that kind of work as well not not be too confusing well you did make it work i mean the i've read a lot of novels where where that does happen and sometimes I get annoyed with it because mm. I go you know I'm trying to follow a story here mm. but you manage to drive the story from start to finish even the jumps forward in time inform the moment that we're in that, that's really the trick yeah, yeah yeah so that yeah I I don't like I generally don't like fractured novel no. no, stories especially when there's like uh you know, they've, there's something in the 60s and something contemporary, and the 60s one is thematically related to yeah, the, yeah, the thing yeah, that's going yeah. on now. I just think, oh, you know, yeah. what, did you want to write two novels? Mm. You know, but, but with this one, it, it's a bit like a, a murder mystery in a way or a thriller. Mm. And so you get, I tried to put in little clues. Yeah. as it was going I had these little clues that, you, and you go oh okay now I've learnt this and mm. oh how does that inform what's going to happen or what or chronologically what has happened in the past you, you, in the present you might learn something about what's happened in the past and mm. then you go to the past and see what actually happened yeah yeah, yeah. And, and it works and I think it's worth saying that, that even though it works as you say like a murder mystery mm. it's a literary piece uh how it reads is lyrical, mm. chilling, um, speaks of the environment enormously. Mm. You know, uh, it's like another character, isn't it? The the West Coast, 
yeah definitely uh, the the my initial drive was to write about the place i always start with place and mm. um and although i'm not from the coast we used to go there a fair bit as kids um i had an uncle who had a batch at, um, at moana and um and yeah it's just a, it's a it's a strange environment you know it's 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 very it's a primitive you know rainforest this temperate rainforest it's it's a it's a world into itself really and um and then you've got the sea and you've got the mountains it's a, it's a rugged place and full of rugged people yeah and you've you've chosen at least as the characters that drive it from the start people from england mm. and i think there's people um even even people who live here underestimate the New Zealand bush mm. and its its dangers. Uh, it's a, it's a wild world out there. Mm. It still is. Yeah, people die all the time. Mm. You know, people get lost and, yeah. and 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 die mountain climbing and and just going for tramps in the bush. You can get lost yeah. quite easily and disappear. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. I wonder what it's like. You know, for the 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 reader who's doesn't live in Aotearoa. Mm. Um, I, I appreciate uh, the characters uh, that speak to me of my own experience, or at least what I know about in this country, you mm. know. Um, gee, I've got to be careful even talking about that. There are no characters. <laughs> you know, Sorry. because I just love the fact that you don't know what's going to happen. So yeah. we won't blow that. But well, um, well, you, you can blow it a little bit. I think yeah, you can. Just, just what, what I generally tell people is that uh, so there's it, it, there's a car accident uh, where these people in '78, uh, a family from England, come to New Zealand. There's a car accident right down south on the west coast. The car goes off the road, disappears into the bush, and the parents are killed. Um, and three children survive. They're quite young, 14, 7, and I think uh, 12, and they, they survive. And uh, then they have to survive by themselves in the, in the remnants of where they've crashed and just in the cold bush in autumn, and it's pretty rugged. And then they get found by a pig hunter, and you think he would take them uh, to safety, but instead they end up, in this uh, isolated valley on the west coast and they're effectively used as indentured labour. Mm, uh, mm. that, that's kind of the, right. now, that's that, where that's, I get up to. Yeah. way too much information. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. But they, <laughs> they, they, they've got to know what they're getting into. I know. <laughs> well, the good thing is, is that even though uh, you've given a fair amount away, mm. every moment still, I, I didn't have a single moment in that where I wasn't wondering mm. And I think that's a, a, a really good element of the storytelling in it. Um, I was wondering, as a writer, you, you know, there, there's a real... The tempo and pace of this novel is really important mm. because even though we're going, what's next, you, you will describe either a situation or an environment... Uh, for some time, not not a ridiculous amount of time, and and it it helps create that tension of what's happening next, mm. but it also describes that character, the New Zealand bush or whatever. Mm. So when you're writing and you're trying to achieve a rhythm and a tempo and a feel, but the the process itself is incredibly drawn out. How do you know that you've that you've got that aspect right, you know, when it takes you a whole morning to write a sentence or whatever, you know. Uh, yeah, I'm not a particularly quick writer. A morning for a sentence would be a bad day. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> well, uh, you know what, what Oscar yeah, yeah, Wilde yeah. said. Um, uh, I've had a very, I've had a very tiring day. This morning, I, I put in a cent, a, a comma, and this afternoon, I took it out again. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's, yeah, that would be a bad day for me. I get a bit frustrated, but, um, but again, I'm not quick. Um, so what I tend to do is um, do do a draft, and then kind of go over that draft. And my drafts tend to be shorter rather than longer. Some people they they write a lot, and then they take stuff out yeah. in order to create that pace that you're asking about. But for me. I tend to not have much and then I add to it and just add to it and add to it and add to it until I get the, the tone and the atmosphere right. But I've got a low tolerance for um, for too much description in mm. other people's writing and for mm. and f for a lack of narrative drive in a story. I, I you know, I really like things to either 
I've got to be totally gripped by the language that the writer's using, yep. or I've got to um, really, really want to know, you know, what, what's happening, and it's got to be quite pacey. So yeah. for me, it's always a balancing act be between those two things. Um, I think dialogue helps. I'm a playwright as well as yeah. doing, doing novels. So I've, when you're writing a play, basically all you're doing is putting in the language. Um, mm. So and I, I, when I'm reading, I like reading dialogue because it, it kind of uh, chugs you along and you get the voices in your head. And, yeah, it does. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah, I, a fair bit of dialogue. And that process well. makes sense that if, if your first draft is basically just how do I drive the story, mm. then that becomes the spine of the thing. Yes, and then you fill in the the maybe the prettier details or get the language right. Yeah, the, yeah. Yeah. For this one, getting the language right was it's a you know a tone of voice that you have to try and capture and then be consistent with it. Mm. That, that, that can be really hard. Yeah, I should say I don't think though that in your case that the, the details are are to do with prettiness. <laughs> they really do help mm. um, make you want to move forward as a reader. And sometimes, like the the, the, the opening sequence that you talked about of a mm. of a car accident, is is happening almost in slow motion as you mm. read it, mm. and there's something about the inevitability of what's going to happen, but. Mm. We have to wait to see it all play out. Yes, yeah, that time slowing down aspect. Mm. Um, but that took me a long time to write. I you bet know, you. Yeah, it did, yeah. It did that. You know, I, I kind of got the first draft and got the idea for that, and and then oh, I couldn't even put an hour figure on it. But you'd be surprised. That's probably only oh, two thousand words, something like that, and um, maybe three thousand words. And I would have spent. Mm. Oh, so many, so many hours, weeks. Yeah, I'm sure. Going over it and then putting it aside and then coming back to it and realising that it didn't quite work yet and then going over it again. And then and then you get to a point, I think we, I think Morris G once said, you know, you, you know something's finished where you start making it worse. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, it was, and, and you get to that point as well. And then so you go over it for maybe the 10th time, go over that scene and start taking it. And you think, oh, it was actually better before I touched it. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Do you have, uh, each day when you start your writing, do you have a plan? Let's, let's look at that first one where you're just basically sketching out the story. Mm. Or does something occur to you that day that takes the story in a particular direction? Um, m mostly the latter. Um, I, I, for this one, I started with the car accident it was a completely different story, actually. It was quite weird. Um, I started, so the process was, I, I started writing this story, which in the very first draft, which is still kicking around somewhere, <laughs> the, it's it's set, there's a, a, a tourist cafe uh, on the coast, and this, and the spirit of the forest, a bit like Tane, kind of appears, mm. it takes human form, walks into the cafe, and um, and then sits down and produces a gold nugget and and gives it to the owner for all the food uh, he can oh, eat. Right. But he but he can eat nearly everything there. So and then he starts telling a story about some kids who who got lost in the bush. Um, and that was my first draft. And I it's still a good idea. But I, I wasn't quite kind of buying it. It didn't feel yeah, quite yeah. like I wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't quite working for me. Uh, but but I'd written five, six, seven thousand words of that story. And then suddenly I got to this bit where, oh, okay, now there's, he's telling a story about some kids who have got lost in the bush after a car crash and they're English kids. I thought, oh, okay, that's really interesting. So suddenly I dumped that whole first bit yeah. um, with, with Tane and, and then ended up, starting at this point and so from there it was relatively it followed relatively easily i knew what was kind of going to happen um it yeah. makes me think of i mean what you've described as a kind of mystical element and there is a slight mystical element in one aspect of this story that is uh, fascinating and i won't uh, spoil it for the listeners mm -hmm. um but largely uh completely really uh it, it is a story that we can believe it is mm. it is uh plausible mm. at every moment um because sometimes you know you, you go yeah right when you're reading a story mm. you know you, you've done this purely to help your thing 
drive forward. But mm. we who live in this country go, yes, I think that could happen. Mm. And yes, there are some characters here that I know are out there. Mm. And, and you've gone, well, what would happen if yes. these things come together? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, I, I wanted it to be plausible and, and believable. Um, and I think a big part of that is kind of the psychology of it. You want to get into the heads of the characters and think, well, how would this person react in that situation and how would this other person react? And, you know, well, what, what's, what are their motivations for, do, for keeping the kids, basically? And, mm. and, you know, and they had to be plausible as well. Um, and oh, wouldn't wouldn't the at one point I figured well this this boy gets a bit older and he's in this situation and um, wouldn't he have just run away? Yeah. And then you couldn't think oh okay well maybe in the car crash he had to have a you know get quite badly injured. Yeah. So then then you have to do a little bit of kind of retrofitting so you go back and <laughs> yeah. say okay well okay yeah so he has a he has a dodgy leg after yeah, that yeah. so he can't just run away he's, he's he's crippled. So that's a retrofit. So that's yeah. another aspect of writing is it mm. is is that that you go in a certain direction then you go oh the preconditions for this yes. have to be seeded. Yeah yeah that's right. You you're seeding things. Yeah and when mm. you're doing your first draft you don't know maybe what you're going to decide to do later on so that mm. so yeah so then you do do a fair bit of retrofitting yeah um yeah well look i hope that's enough for people to be fascinated and read the book i'm a picky reader uh, and i really really enjoyed it excellent um what about the rest of you say you're a, you've a, a playwright um mm -hmm. and your your plays i know have been at just about every theater i can think of in the country mm. Do you see yourself as essentially a writer? Do you have a preference for anything? Um, I like flip-flopping around a bit because uh, novels are quite demanding. It's a bit like running a marathon, really. You know, yeah. It takes quite a long time and you spend a lot of time by yourself. Um, I, I've just flipped over to doing a play and a comedy play because the novel's relatively heavy so you know doing so doing a comedy and and working with actors and in workshops and um talking about ideas and 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 a play's fifteen thousand words something like that whereas you know that that novel's about seventy five eighty thousand words so it's a lot shorter mm. um so yeah i just enjoy moving from one to the other but essentially it's all it's all storytelling yeah. you're just in a different mode Yep. Um, and whether it's comedy or drama, um, uh, you're still telling stories and the rules are pretty much the same for telling a good story, whatever mode you're in. Mm. Um, it's just the voice changes. Yeah. Now, this is a question that shouldn't have to be asked, but this is New Zealand. Can mm. you make a living from it? Um, <laughs> it's, a, uh, it's, it's tricky. Um, I would like to thank the government for their support. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Because you do, you basically, as a, as a, as a writer, you do need uh, grants in order to survive because yep. you just do the maths on it and, um, and it doesn't really stack up for the amount of time that you, yep. you put into it financially. Mm. Uh, so that one was written partly on the Catherine uh, Mansfield uh, Fellowship when I was in France mm. um, and that's partly funded by Creative New Zealand. Yep. Um, and I just got another Creative New Zealand grant to write another novel. Um, but without those grants, you know, novels wouldn't be produced in New Zealand unless you happen to be married to a very wealthy woman yeah you know or, or a very wealthy uh, guy if you happen to be a woman so and and that's not that's not saying anything bad about the writers it's just the 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 fact of yeah. a small population mm. um just you just can't sell enough books no and look it's 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 a fact that there are certain things that are of great value to the community mm. that can't be paid for by the commercial model and we do it uh you know grants are given and things mm. and uh you are contributing usefully to our community whether we can afford you or not <laughs> <laughs> that's nice of you to say not everyone sees it like that the more more conservative people might say oh you know if you can't make your own way I know. Then, then you shouldn't be getting the money but but then again every, every you know half of the people who work in wellington and yeah. every school teacher and hospital employee <laughs> if you went that way we could wouldn't say be it employed. about you know team new zealand in the america's cup or, or whatever you <laughs> know true, yeah. public money there too mm, exactly yeah. yeah exactly um having said that though um this novel is being published um in germany 
uh, later in the year and in France and then there's an American and a UK edition coming out right. um, next year, end of next year. So hopefully I might recoup some of the government's yeah. investment. <laughs> Won't it be interesting to see it in German or whatever? You know, how do... The, that kind of laconic uh, style of talking that we're so familiar with here, mm. you know, New Zealand slang or people out in the bush. Yeah. I've had one translated into German before, and um, it's tricky for the translators. Uh, so you get, you get a weird thing, um, depending on who translates it. Some people will either contact you like crazy by, by email yeah. saying, what the hell is a milk bottle lolly? You know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. or what's a zip? I've had that a few times. What's a zip? You know, zip on the wall, right. uh, like with oh, boiling yeah, hot yeah, water yeah. zip. What's yeah. a zip? And you yeah. go, oh, and you have to explain it. Das Califont. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, and so the tra the translators don't know, so then they have to figure out some German equivalent or drop it i think sometimes or or change it yeah uh, so yeah, yeah it, it, it translation is a huge you know a huge skill you really because being fluent that fluent in two languages it's like wow yeah you know. yeah and they have to be creative themselves they it's um, a it's a writing job oh for sure my mm. german translator for uh, my novel rocking horse road um I'm pretty sure he 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 rewrote the thing. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't. Know. <laughs> well, I I don't know, but I, but I did do a little uh, tour with him um, in Germany, and um, and he was getting some laughs on lines that I'm pretty sure weren't yeah. funny in the English. But but you know, like he just tweaked it a little bit so that it, it was a little bit more laconic or yeah. a little bit funnier or so, something. He was people going, oh yeah, that was really amusing, and I'm like. That scene's not a music. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, yes, you, you, I suppose you, you know when you get a question like, um, I was amused by the scene with the kangaroo. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you <yeah>. go, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, hopefully there was a kangaroo in it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, look, uh, great to have you. Uh, and I know you've got to get back to Wellington and we're due for a coffee over at Trocadero. Yes, sounds good. Look forward to that. Mm. Thanks for participating in Yarns and Barns. It's a, a great thing for the region. Mm. Yeah, I was really happy to be asked. It's, um, you know, it's, it's a great opportunity to come up here and um, uh, sh share with the community and, um, and, you know, and visit the area. I've been here for years. Great. Thank you very much. Carl Nixon, everybody, read the tally stick. Really good. Goodbye. Thank you.